Okay, guys, let's begin. Thank you all for coming. Darknet Liverpool's monthly event. Um, just a, a quick shout out. We've got some Twitter feeds there. We've got a meetup page, which you've probably all seen and probably come, come through, hopefully. Um, and just to let everyone know, this session will be recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel as well. Um, I can find the right. A quick shout out to our sponsors for helping us with our group and expanding. So TLA have uh, helped with the costs for, um, for .NET Liverpool. And thanks to JetBrains as well, we've also got some licenses to give away, which we'll talk about in a bit as well. Um, so just a shout out to these two companies which are helping this, um, this, this meetup group today. Uh, the JetBrain license, which we've got to give away if you want. Um, if you're interested in it, we've got a couple of licenses. So just put in the chat. They do quite a lot of things. I guess one of the main things they're uh, known for, which I like, in the .NET world is the ReSharper license, which is a tool for Visual, Visual Studio. It'll help you be a better programmer, essentially. It does a lot of cool stuff, but they've uh, got a lot of stuff for C++ and um, .NET coverage and stuff like that, and unit tests. So do check out a lot of their tools, but if you're interested in any of them, um, you can even PM me directly in the chat and we'll go from there and we'll put you all in a little raffle and we'll, um, we'll get a winner at the end of this. Um, some local groups as well. So we'll, we're our group is local to Liverpool, but we're virtual. So we're happy to get everyone in from all the way around the world. And obviously, it's easier for, for us to record. Some 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 else to check out as well. This one's a lot of uh, this one's obviously a presentation. So you're going to learn a lot more virtually. But if you want to get um, a bit more hands-on experience, there's also a group called Mini Hack, and they are on next month. And I think John Skeet is going to be one of the judges which is pretty cool. Um, so you go in there, hack around with some code, get some prizes as well. So do check them out if you want to as well, if you're into that sort of thing. And just remember, yeah, this is recorded. We will put it on YouTube. If nobody wants to be on YouTube or anything like that, one of our YouTube channels, just message us and we can remove you from that or just keep your cameras off. And you, obviously you can change your names if you like as well. Um, so other than that, yeah, I'll pass you on to Lee. Thanks, Lee. Cheers, Josh. I'll just share my screen then. Have I got the option to share my screen? Uh, the option to share my screen's disappeared, Josh. We had it a minute ago. Try again now. I just uh, allow multiple. Yep, found it. Thank you. No worries. Yes, that looks a bit better. Yeah, fantastic. Right. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks ever so much for having me. Been uh, wanting to speak at the, uh, your meetup for a while now, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here to talk about this topic of, of augmented reality because it's something I think doesn't get shouted out about enough. Um, but just to give a bit of a background as, as to who I am, uh, my name is uh, Lee Engelson. I'm a .NET developer by trade. Uh, I wanted to get into iPhone development and then I got a bit distracted with this augmented reality stuff. So then I started to see if I could use my uh, .NET skills to create it. And it turns out I could. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do it uh, today and the kind of things you can um, achieve. Ah, yes, sir. So that's my name. Uh, I'm the dev manager over at uh, Interact. We are recruiting at the moment, so I would be uh, told off if I didn't um, mention that. You know, we're looking specifically for senior devs. We build some intranets for some big, big names uh, like PlayStation and the co-op and stuff like that. You've probably never heard of us. I, I hadn't heard of us until I joined, but um, big, big names, like I said. Uh, I blog at manchesterdeveloper.com. Uh, if you want to see what I'm up to, you can see me there. I've also created another website you might be interested in called visualstudiotips.co.uk. I think that's got over 30 or 40 tips of Visual Studio. Check that out. Uh, and then a lot of the stuff that you're going to see today, I put on another website called xamarinarkit.com where it shows you how you can combine those technologies to achieve what we're going to look at today. I'm also on GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube. So you can find me uh, on there. There aren't many uh, Lee Engelstones. There is another Lee Engelstone. If you find this person, this isn't me. So there's another Lee Engelson, apparently he's into his stock rally car racing. That's not me. I'm not that exciting or interesting, I'm afraid. Right. 
Okay, so just to set some expectations, um, there's a few things that we're not going to discuss today. Um, we're not going to talk about the HoloLens, other than to say there's a picture of me uh, wearing one, and for some reason didn't shave that day, so I don't know what that's about. Uh, mixed reality toolkit, we're not going to talk about Unity, virtual reality, AR core, or web AR. Don't worry, I have got a slide about what we actually are going to talk about next. But um, I'm not saying these aren't good technologies. You can definitely use these to create augmented reality experiences. It's just not um, what we're going to be talking about today. So what are we going to talk about today? We are going, I'm going to show you how we can create um, augmented reality experiences without an expensive headset like HoloLens, without using Swift or Objective-C, without using Xcode, small caveat on that, you do need to use it initially just to deploy some certificates uh, and without being involved in a paid developer program. So I'm gonna show you how we can develop for iOS devices using .NET and C-sharp, using a Mac and using Visual Studio for Mac. Right. Or specifically, these are the kind of things we're gonna cover. What exactly is augmented reality, the business of augmented reality, um, how us as .NET developers can, can do that, and then some of the more specific use cases like image detection, plane detection, face tracking, uh, we're gonna look at as well. Right, uh, what I'd like to do is right at the beginning, just show you a video of the kind of thing we're looking at rather than you getting really bored and then me showing you the interesting stuff right at the middle of the end. So I'm just gonna scooch over and show you some, some videos if that's all right. Right, which one to show you? Uh, let's get this on. I've got a full screen. Right, so um, it's going to be a lot crisp in real life. This is just a maximized YouTube video. But um, so what we've got here is 2D planes are all spinning around in sort of like a, a sphere. And um, we've got images or wallpaper specifically uh, that we're using as the material for those. And um, I'm stood in the middle and they're rotating around me and I can move position and they'll stay in place. And uh, I can go and make it a double-sided as well. And I can even cast fake shadows on the ground. That's the kind of thing that we're gonna look at today. Might sneak another quick one in. Uh, let's look at another one. Oh, this is probably the best one. So in this one, I've uh, combined some animations, some opacity, which is really easy. We're gonna look at how to do that. Um, and here we're just showing how you can I'm just showing the periodic table in augmented reality. And then you can actually touch these on your screen. It'll detect, detect, that's, detect that's not a word, detect the thing you're touching. Uh, and then it will respond to that and it's playing an animation. So these are the kind of things that, that I've been experimenting with and the kind of thing that is possible using ARKit C Sharp and Xamarin. So there you go. That's the kind of thing we're going to look at today. Ah, but you can also, if you want, try it for yourself, go and download this free app that I've created called AR Samples. And this is what it started off life is just be experimenting um, with these the different things you can do, put them in an app, and then I just put them on the app store so you can go and um, uh, download that and try that if you want. Completely up to you. There will be quite a few QR codes on this screen just because it's easier for people to, to um, use the phone to go and see these things. So whenever there's a QR code, I'll probably just pause for a few seconds. Uh, and then if you're not quick enough, too bad, we're going on to the next slide. Right. So this is the breakdown of the talk, really. It's in three parts. The, the first part, which is the smallest part, we're going to look at the background of augmented reality, make sure we're all on the same page, what we're talking about. The second part, which is a little bit bigger, but still small, is talk about um, how is augmented reality often used in the real world? Because as cool as technology it is, it is, there's not much point in doing it unless it's got real world applications and a business is making money out of it. And then we, for the most of the talk, we're gonna look at the implementation and, and how we actually uh, make do some of the cool things. So part one, what is augmented reality? Now there's quite a few definitions of augmented reality flying, uh, flying around, but um, I decided to come up with my own because I didn't quite like the ones that were I could find. Uh, so this is my definition of augmented reality. And this is the definition that if my mum asked me what it was, this is what I would tell her. It would be a bit very out of character for her to ask me, but um, it is making something look like it is there that isn't actually there. And that's the best way I can describe it. That's not to be confused with virtual reality. In virtual reality, you put a headset on, your whole vision's occluded, and everything you can see is projected to you, 
um, through the app that's running in it. With augmented reality, you can still see the world around you, but the app that's running is placing things inside the real world, or apparently to look like it's in the real world with you. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about virtual, virtual uh, augmented reality. So ARKit is the framework we're using today to create those experiences. There are a few of them, but this is what I'm going to be looking at, and that is Apple's augmented reality framework that runs on iOS. Uh, it uses something very, very clever, which I can never describe very, very well, but it uses something called visual inertial odometry. And it, what that does, it takes a combination of um, frames in the camera, every other frame, and it combines that with the things on the device like the accelerometer and um, uh, uses a bit of computer vision as well, just looking at my notes. And uh, then it, when you place things in the scene, it's clever enough to remember, oh, I remember this tree. Uh, you place something, you place something a, ne a meter away from that tree before, so I better show it when it, you pan over there. So yeah, it, it's clever stuff. Um, so it's been ARKit, the, the framework was ported over by Xamarin, sorry, to .NET by Xamarin. And then when, uh, sorry, it's on the next slide. When Microsoft bought Xamarin, they, they effectively rolled this into Visual Studio as well. Uh, so this isn't to be confused with AR Core. AR Kit is Apple's augmented reality framework and AR Core is um, Android's Apple, Real, sorry, augmented reality framework. So we won't be talking about AR Core today. We're gonna to be focusing on, on AR Kit. Right. Uh, yeah, I mentioned this a little bit. So what is Xamarin? Xamarin was a, um, well, it's a cross, cross, cross platform app development tool set, which allows you to write C sharp and deploy it to iOS and Android devices. As I said, they were acquired by Microsoft and now it's been rolled into Visual Studio. Uh, and it so happens we can make use of ARKit, which was ported into it uh, to create some augmented reality experiences. Now, that was the introduction bit, so that was very quick uh, and painless. So we're going to go into the business side of, of augmented reality. Um, whenever I talk about augmented reality and the applications of it to people, I get a few different viewpoints and they seem to be quite polarized, um, the different sides of the spectrum. So one of them is, um, if you see Peter Jones from Dragon Den top right, the one response is, uh, I don't get it. Why, why would you want to make something appear there that's not really there that's fine you know some people just don't care get it they, they don't care that's fine um there's some people that are whose reaction is a bit more towards the bottom left with deborah meaden and peter jones saying oh my god this is amazing this is going to change everything this has got so many applications uh, okay and then there's some people that are in the middle uh which is another dragon on the den they're saying that's impressive it's cool it's neat i don't know how useful it is but it, you know it, it's pretty cool um, I, I kind of lean towards the, it's going to be really big, um, side of things, but yeah, I know everyone's not going to be excited about this stuff as much as I am. Okay. So when we're talking about real world successful applications of augmented reality, we probably should talk about Pokemon Go. So for me, um, Pokemon Go was when I started to sit up and really think about augmented reality. It, it said to me, yeah, it's, it, augmented reality is um, starting to come of age now because it proved to me not only are people willing to use their phone and wave it around to make things appear there that aren't actually there, they're happy, they enjoy it and they're happy to pay for it as well. So I don't know if you know this, but Pokemon Go made $100 million in its first 20 days. So when I say made, I mean people paid $100 million uh, of add-ons and stuff like that to use it. Uh, and in the first month it made $207 million. So that's um, that's quite a big payday for the developers. And uh, I've, I've never actually played it myself, but um, uh, yeah, this is what we're looking at. Another slide on Pokemon Go. Don't worry, not all my um, slides are on Pokemon Go, but uh, I just wanna mention this slide slightly out of date, but over about four years, um, whoever made Pokemon Go, people have spent about $3 billion um, on, on Pokemon Go. So this is uh, a ludicrous amount of money for to pay, for, that people are willing to pay to have an augmented reality experience. But it's not all entertainment and games. We're starting to see an increasing number of more mainstream 
businesses start to use augmented reality. So here we can see uh, a lady trying on uh, glasses that aren't actually there. She can change different frames and see how they look on her face without actually having to go to the opticians and try and own these, these different frames, which is pretty useful if, you, if you're you know, in a pandemic and you're pretty much housebound and you can't leave it and all the shops are closed. So uh, I've not tried that one. One I have tried is this one. So do I recommend you try this and it might just change your mind about augmented reality if you're not, um, not so sure about it. If you download this app, you can look through a catalog of shoes and then you can point the phone at your feet and it will look like uh, it will show you what the, the shoes look like on your feet. That's um, that's pretty neat, if you ask me. Um, but uh, it's not just shoes. There's another there's, there's apps that have come to the market that let you see what rings and jewellery look like on you and what watches look like on your wrist. So we are seeing an, uh, an increasing number of use cases of it. We're also seeing an increasing number of manufacturers that are creating 3D models and providing them in a format that you can then use them on your phone and see what they look like in your home. And it ranges from home appliances to, to handbags. So you can see what it looks like while actually buying it. And there's quite a lot of research gone into it saying that if people do this, they are much, much more likely to convert and actually buy the product. Uh, some increase very, very large uh, conversion rates that I can see. And here you can see that this was actually taken from a Google website and they're actually showing you how to create these file formats and get them indexed so that when you search for, what's this, uh, coffee machine? Coffee making. When you search for coffee machine, you appear in the search results, you can view that without even coming out of the search results and then you can go off and buy it. So even Google uh, and some of the retailers, even Amazon, I believe, are trying to incorporate augmented reality into the whole e-commerce buying process. Right, and that's all well and good, but um, for me, the next evolution of, of augmented reality won't be on our phones. It will be uh, on our, um, it will be when one or more augmented reality glasses come to market. We've got the HoloLens, Fantastic device, but it's not really a, a device that your average Joe will buy. It, it's more an industry uh, uh, product that big, big businesses can afford and, and um, industry types, that sort of thing. But I think when augmented reality takes off is when people can just put these glasses on and it just works. And it's going to be software developers like us that are building these interfaces, don't forget. And, you know, before long, too long, there will be lots and lots of job adverts saying wanted augmented reality uh, interface design, stuff like that. You'll see that increasingly, I'm sure. So we won't have to rely on our little black screens to get information anymore, as we have done uh, for years and years. Uh, I'll just mention on that, it's not just the big players that are coming out with these these devices as well, like your Apples and your Googles. There are dozens and dozens of manufacturers all racing to get to the market with these sort of things. And don't get me wrong, the version ones might not be very good. If you think about the first version of the iPhone, it was revolutionary at the time. You look back now, it's a, it was a dinosaur. So whilst the first version of these glasses or the first generation of these glasses uh, might not be great, you know, version two, three, four, five, they're gonna be absolutely amazing. Right, okay. Uh, so this is my little, um, uh, I'm just going to annotate that if I can. This is my little equation as to what's going to be the success of, of augmented reality. It's going to be a number of com uh, combinations all having to, to come together. So we're seeing, we, we know that customers want to use it. Oh no, where's my pen gone? Sorry. I do like to annotate where I can. Pen. Yep. So we know we've got the customers because we've got people paying $100, $3 billion uh, to see Charizard or Bobazar, whatever they're called. Um, and we know we have got uh, um, the businesses are all trying to do it. They're all experimenting with how they can get uh, their products and getting people spending them more. And we know we've got the software. So not only have we got AR kit, we, you can use Unity to create augmented reality experiences. Facebook have got one called AR, um, Spark AR. And we have got, oh, AR core from, from Android, uh, and there's a couple of others as well. So the software's there, so that that's available to, to create the, the experiences. So what we're waiting for now really is the hardware to, to, to catch up. 
uh, with the glasses particularly, and then it's going to be a massive, massive, massive industry. Right, so that's part two done, the business side of things. Hopefully you still follow me and not falling asleep. So this is where we're going to look at some interesting videos and stuff like that and talk about the actual implementation of, of these experiences. So this is us popping the hood and looking at how things are working. Um, just one small caveat when you do set up and you want to try and get involved in this sort of thing, you will need a Mac. Um, if you want to, if you want to build anything and deploy it to your iOS devices, you will, you will need a Mac. Um, this is no differently. Um, you'll need an Apple developer account, but you would just need an Apple ID. You will not need an Apple paid developer account unless you want to do deploy what you've created to the store. So you can do all this experimentation like I've done for months and months and months for free, basically over there, the cost of an uh, MacBook for sure. Um, da, da, da. So you'll need to create this initial project in Xcode uh, and then deploy it to your device. And once you've done that and you've, you create a bundle ID and you've, you've, you've deployed some certificates to your iOS device, you can almost close Xcode and not look at it again for, for a while. But you will remember, need to remember that bundle ID that you used when you created that Xcode project and deployed it to your phone. Cause you'll reuse that uh, when you, come to create your project in Visual Studio for Mac. And then from there on in, you can just write C Sharp uh, to, to create these uh, experiences, as long as you use the same bundle ID. Right, so this is uh, Visual Studio. Sorry, no. So what you'll need is to create a single view app in Xcode on the left here. And the reason I mention that is because you don't want to use this augmented reality uh, app here. It's a bit of a gotcha. You, how I've done it anyway, I'm sure there's multiple ways of doing it. I was using this single view app here. Uh, and then when you open Visual Studio for Mac, you want to again create, choose this uh, single view app under app or iOS. So we're not talking about Xamarin.forms, by the way. That's a common question is we're not using Xamarin.forms. We are using the uh, iOS um, library in Xamarin for Visual Studio. Okay. So then before we look at the augmented reality stuff, I need to mention that another framework that makes all this possible and, and some of the exp uh, examples I'm gonna show you is, well, that went backwards by itself, hmm. uh, is using Apple's UI framework, sorry, 3D graphics framework called SceneKit. What that does, it allows you to put solid shapes, images, video, sounds into your environment and then also as well as materials, lights uh, and cameras and stuff like that. It's very clever. I mean, this was around before ARKit came on the scene. So people were creating games in this long before there was augmented reality. And it also includes a physics engine and a particle, ge a particle generator, which I've never used. But I will show you the physics engine very briefly. So that's scene kit. And then this slide shows where scene, scene kit stops in ARKit begins, but I didn't come up with this slide. It was, uh, so I'll full creds to um, Ryan Davis, whoever he is, I've never met the chap I spoke to him, but he creates a good slide. Uh, so this, everything in green, I believe, comes from uh, AR, AR kit. Uh, everything in blue, wrong way around. Sorry, beg your pardon. Everything in blue, gotta stop doing that. Uh, everything in blue is, comes from AR kit and everything that comes, it, in green comes from scene kit and you can usually tell by what the prefix you know it begins where they are it's from AR kit if it begins with scene scn it's from scene kit um and we'll come over so we'll go to some of these things later on okay so the main thing that makes this magic possible is something called the augmented reality scene view and what this does it combines the 3d content that you're injecting into your app as well with the camera feed at the same time when the when the AR session uh, is actually running and it renders it uh, over the over the camera. Uh, yes, session that I just mentioned. Da, 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 da. The one thing I will mention when this augmented reality session is running on your phone is that the accuracy of the app being able to detect your surroundings like there's a chair or what looks like a chair, it doesn't know it's a chair, it's just shape of the chair uh, and a tree and a desk and stuff like that. It depends on a number of things. One of them is lighting. So if you're in a dark room, it's gonna really 
struggle to detect what it calls feature points. So if you can't detect feature points, points of interest around the scene, it really struggles. So if you try and put a 3D object in that scene, it struggles to keep it there and it will, in a, it struggles to keep it stationary in relation to the real world. And it'll start moving around. Whereas if you're in a very well lit place, um, it'll have no trouble. As you can see from the, um, the periodic table one, that just stays still. It knows so many feature points, nice and light outside, big tree in the background. Uh, the other thing that it struggles with is any materials that are plain, like a, a, just a plain white wall, if you think about it, if, you, if your camera's just staring at a white wall, it's got very, very few feature points to recognize and, uh, and try and keep track of. And the other thing that it struggles with, sounds like I'm just talking about it's all its bad sides, but I'm just trying, these are just caveats. Uh, the other thing it struggles with is reflective material. So things like mirrors or glass or highly reflective material, it struggles with them sometimes as well. And we'll look, we'll talk about feature points a little bit in a bit. Now, anchors are what allows ARKit to place items in the scene and remember where it's put it. And it, there's a points of interest in the scene. And we can either manually place anchors in the scene and, and, be, and want our app to remember that we've placed one there. Or what normally happens is, depending on the kind of app we're creating, it will, act, it will automatically place a specialized anchor there. So if we've got surface detection, sorry, plane detection turned on, whenever it detects a, a plane, it will drop a plane anchor at that location. And, or if we're telling it to detect a particular image and it detects that image, it will place an image anchor at that location. And it's the same with objects and face faces, which we'll, we'll talk about them in a bit. So anchors are pretty important. Now, we need to talk about the 3D coordinate system. It's not the most complicated 3D coordinate in the system, 3D coordinate system uh, in the world. Uh, it's pretty intuitive if you ask me. Uh, when we look at some code later on, you'll see the sizes are in floating point types, whereas one F is equivalent to one meter, which is very, very easy to remember, as you can imagine. And that means not point one F is 10 centimeters, and not point not not one F is one centimeters. And you can go big with this sort of stuff, or you can go very small. <clears throat> now, X, Y, Z is interesting. X is traditionally side to side. Uh, if you look at the diagram, if you want to go to the left, you need to place it, set its minus X position. If you want to position it to the right, plus X, plus Y is putting it up, minus Y is down. Now Z is going to get you, if you ever look at this stuff, it got me. It's backwards and forwards, it is not forwards and backwards. So, for example, you see in this diagram, minus Z is in front of you. So when I was first starting out with this stuff, I was saying, right, I'm just going to put a plane cube or sphere one meter in front of me. Surely I need to put it one F in the Z axis. And it took me ages to realize I'm actually putting it a meter behind me. And I was there looking around saying, where is this thing? It should be in front of me. And I look behind me and it's there. So as soon as you remember that plus Z puts it behind you, the happier you'll be. And it took me embarrassing, embarrassing uh, amount of time to realize that. Now, when you start your augmented reality session, when it starts, wherever you were holding or stood with the app when it started is the world origin. That is zero, 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 okay? So if you place an object in the scene and you don't set its position, it will be where the camera started. So if you place it in, this, in the scene and then take a step back, it will be there in front of you. If you stood where you put it, you're not gonna be able to see it. So just remember that the world origin is at zero, 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 where you started, okay? Now, scene nodes, these are, that's a class. Um, and this is almost like your smallest units you're gonna be working with, I guess. I like to think of these as Lego bricks. <clears throat> your Lego bricks can come in different shapes and sizes and they can have different functions and do different things. And one Lego brick by itself isn't particularly interesting, but if you start putting them together, then you can start building some interesting experiences. Now on this scene node, you can set its geometry, which is the shape of the node. Um, so you can, and it's got some built-in geometries we'll look at later. 
Uh, if you don't give it a geometry by default, it will be invisible and you can actually do good, interesting things with invisible nodes, but uh, never mind. Um, you need to, you can set its material. So you might, the geometry might be a sphere and its material might be uh, green, solid green, or the geometry might be a 2D plane that's a meter wide, high and long, just a flat plane, and its material might be an image. And then we can also assign physics to the node and tell it how we want it to behave. Do we want it to be pulled down as if it were affected by gravity? Do we want things to bump into it? Do we want to have it a solid skeleton as well? But I've got a, a slide later on about physics. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, I sometimes jump out of the code at this point, but we'll look at the code later and you'll see that we'll be looking at nodes anyway, because you can't do anything without nodes. So we'll pick that up again later. Now, geometries, we mentioned this, there are some built in geometries, and this is where I need to get my pen again and try not to advance the slide. Yes, pen. Uh, so from left to right, we can use built in geometries. We have box, not cube, box, because a cube is always the same dimensions, right? It's like a dice. Whereas a box could be like your Amazon box, it could be tall and thin, wide and flat. <clears throat> so that's your box. Then we've got capsule. Looks, looks a bit like a tablet. Then we've got cone. I've never used these, by the way. I've never found a use case to, to put a, um, a cone in my um, scene. Uh, cylinder, uh, plane, I use them an awful lot. Pyramid, again, never ever use them. Um, sphere, which is just a circle, which is not as useful as you think, unless you're trying to just show a planet. Uh, torus, which is this donut shape, and I want to say tube. Yeah, tube, just like a cylinder with one in the middle. And then one that I always forget, which is hidden in plain sight, is text, scene text. Um, so you can actually put 3D text into the scene, but it's a little bit fiddly. So be warned. Uh, next slide. Let's let's go and jump and look at some code then. Um, a bit of an appropriate time. See if I can find the appropriate file. Right, okay. A lot of this is boilerplate code, so I'll explain it once, but then I won't explain it each time. I'll just say what's different in each example. I'm gonna zoom in as much as I can without going crazy, um, because I realize that sometimes when I'm presenting, I forget to do that and people are squinting because they can't see anything. So we have got uh, a lot of this code. Admittedly, I don't know what it does. It just, <laughs> I've just taken examples and um, got its work and just extended upon it. And that's how a lot of us developers work, right? So we have this scene view that we talked about previously when in the controller, we are instantiating it. And here we can, we can set all sorts of defaults, which I won't go into that much. And then we add it to this, uh, this views as a sub view of this view. Again, couldn't tell you exactly what that does, but you can kind of infer that it's adding a view, it, this, this augmented reality scene view to a view uh, that, that's been loaded. Uh, to, to, and then when the view did load, it's set in the frame of the scene view to this to be this view's frame. And I guess what it's doing at this point is it's set in the background of this view to be the camera feed, I, I guess. Um, I imagine this scene view is doing a lot of magic in the background. So then I'm just gonna skip over this get material just for briefly. Uh, and then in this view did appear, what we're doing is we are getting this session and we are running it and we're set, giving it a, a configuration. And there's different types of configuration depending on what you want to achieve. If you want to do face tracking, you give it a face tracking configuration. Um, if you want to do bad body tracking, you give it a body tracking configuration, but we just want uh, the bog standard um, experience. So this is AR world tracking configuration. And then here, this is where sort of the, the non boilerplate code uh, happens. So we're setting a side, which is 0.05F, which will be five centimeters. Yes, yes, five centimeters. We are giving it Z position minus 4f, which means we are putting it, don't forget minus is in front of us, 40 centimeters in front of us. Um, we are creating a scene node. Remember these are like our Lego bricks. Then we're setting its geometry. And um, depending on what you're creating, 
you create you you call this static method on on the type of geometry creating so for this one we're creating a box setting the dimensions um and we are setting its material we're just saying i want this to be red and the material one is up here uh and this is what we're doing here i could possibly reuse this code again this code is written for readability and being able to explain the concept if you're saying this code you probably shouldn't put in your production you're probably right so just um just give me a break on some of this code if you've seen repeated code stuff like that i know you're not supposed to repeat code and i'd hope everyone on this call does too but <clears throat> anyway going back to this so then i'm setting this position to be uh zero zero so it's going to be nothing left or right nothing up or down but i'm going to set it um 40 centimeters in front of me and i'm doing the same here i'm creating a sphere and i'm creating a torus and depending on the geometry it has these different dimensions we're passing on in so that's x y z sorry width length height and this last one is, is chamfer radius so how um sharp do you want them corners do you want them to be as sharp you can cut yourself on or do you want me to be more rounded as a dice uh for this sphere one we're just setting the radius uh, and then there's a few for the different geometries there's different parameters you pass in and then after we've created these scene nodes set geometry the material and the position adding that child adding that scene node as a child node to the root node in the scene and that's all you have to do basically and then when you run it you will see um the the shapes just floating in the air wherever you put them I don't think i've got video for that let me just quickly check even if i do it's gonna be quite boring that's yeah, I don't have one for that. Nope. Anyway, got more interesting videos later to show you. Right, so that's geometries. Okay, so then placing things in the scene would be pretty boring unless you could uh, move them in some way. If you place them in the scene, you don't move them, look pretty static and, and dead. And what you can do is use these animations. Now, I use the word animations. They're not actually called animations they're called scene actions i only refer to them as animations because you can animate a, a node's opacity so get it to fade in or fade out it's opacity over time it's scale so you can make it grow and shrink over time uh the the location of it so you can get it moving around or the rotations you can have it turning and you can group these animations as well quite easily so you can have something um, move towards you and increase in size at the same time um, and you can get them to go one after another or happen them at the same time. And that's quite, um, quite interesting. And you can then also get them to repeat either once over and over backwards and forwards, and then you can ease the animations in and out. So rather than, <clears throat> rather than a car going from zero to 60 in a millisecond, which would probably kill the passengers, obviously you, you, it accelerates very, not very slowly, but slowly gets to 60 and slows down to a stop unless you've, hit a wall or something but um yeah so that's what easing is it just it just smooths out those animations so we don't just go start stop it builds up and, and slows down now uh, animations i'll put leave this on the screen a little bit for anyone to use the qr codes if they want that will just take you to the, the specific youtube video you might be wondering why i'm doing that and it's because i've given this talk before and either during the present presenting or during the recording um the videos look really jagged and um, stop start so i wouldn't want anyone to have a bad uh, come away thinking oh gosh augmented reality using air kit, ar kit isn't smooth it is really smooth it's just um you need to see it for yourself and sometimes through these presentations isn't the best way <clears throat> but uh, we looked at the periodic table example where we combined moving and opacity but we'll look quickly at the the globe one because the spinning globe is it's very very simple to achieve but very very cool and effective so here we've got just the planet earth that's um being placed uh, in front of me as i move closer towards it let me put that full screen so you're not seeing weird stuff um and it's just spinning again we're reanimating its its rotation and um we've also got ever so slight amount of opacity in it you can't see it, it might be something like 95 percent opaque so you can just about see it so one word of advice, if you're ever creating these sort of experiences, opacity makes everything look cooler and more futuristic. 
So that's just my advice. Let's, uh, let's have a quick look at the code for animations as well. And I'll show you how easy it is to group these things. Again, I won't go through all the boilerplate again, I'm using the same uh, configuration. For this, now the, the animation I'm doing here is uh, I'm creating the torus and I've just got a, a class that's inheriting from scene node and I'm setting all the geometry and it's material in there and it's just returning me this, this scene node place in my scene. And then when I get back back, I'm gonna say, I want you to rotate by, and that's effectively 360 degrees in the X axis, I think. Yeah, X axis over a period of five seconds. So by default, that would do that once that we, we use this repeat forever behavior and um, we say repeat this action forever. And then we say on that node, run this action, this repeat forever. And we add it to the scene and we have a torus, which is, is just spinning indefinitely. Okay. So that is animations. Now plane detection is a very interesting one. Um, what you can do is you can detect both horizontal and vertical planes. So that's floors or tabletops and also um, uh, walls around, around you as well, uh, around us as well. And the interesting thing is that as you move your camera around and you give ARKit more information, it is able to, de to determine if that plane is bigger than it thought, is smaller than it thought, if two places it thought was two different planes is actually the, the same, two different parts of the same floor, it will join them up. It's really quite clever. Um, and it creates these AR plane anchors when detected. Now you might think, well, why would you want to detect planes? Now there's been at least one or more businesses that use this quite well. So I've seen businesses allow you to see what wallpaper looks like on your walls or try to decorate your room or, or place furniture in your room. And it, to, be, to do that, you need to be able to detect the floor, right? Well, that's what we're going through the floor or, or hovering above it, which isn't really lifelike. <clears throat> Right, so the plane detection one, I will go and load that up. We probably won't look at the code for that because if I showed you the code for every example, we might be here a long time. If I can find it, plane detection. Right, okay. Right, so, so this is running and you might see some little yellow dots. I'll explain them in a bit. Now it is detecting like a surface and so there's the bookcase and then moving around. Now. And remember what I said, plain white walls, it will struggle to detect, but it's had no problem detecting that dotted poster. Uh, and it will detect the floor in a minute. Now, it was probably a little bit dark when I did this in my study. That's why it's um, struggling to pick up the feature points and determine that that's a plane there. If this was done outside or there's a bit more light in, in here, it would be able to pick these up a lot more. So eventually I'll just skip on a bit. It does be able to map um, almost the whole thing. I don't know why it's not picking up the, the ceiling, to be honest, before you ask. It's kind of cool. Now, the yellow dots, you might be able to see. Oh, yeah, there's a good view of it then. Now, these are the feature points that it is able to pick out. If you see lots of feature points, it means there's a lot of interesting things in that scene that it can try and remember where it was. If there's few, it means you've probably not got enough uh, light or the, the lighting conditions are too poor for it to, to really work very well. And that's, um, you can turn that as a debug flag on and off whilst you're trying out your different um, things. <clears throat> right, so that's plane detection. Image detection. This is pretty neat uh, when you use it. So you can detect up to 100 different images, which means as you're building your app, you can bundle with it 100 different images and you can give them each a name and it will react when it detects that image in the scene. So if you had a pack of 52 cards, if you want, wanted, you could upload each of image and bundle it along with your app and you could hover your app over the, the card and it will be able to tell you which, which card it is, it'll be able to detect it. Um, and what we'll, I'll show you what we're doing after, with that information is we can then use that information of where that image is, how big it is, and we can then place things upon that image. And that's quite an interesting use case. Now, 
as well as bundling images with the app, you can dynamically add images to it as well. And you're thinking, well, why would you want to do that? Well, if you think about it, we're not always going to have all the information you want at compile time. So if you think about it, you could go off to the Amazon API, say, get me the 10 most popular business books, um, get me the 10 images. Uh, let's go 100, let's go big. The, last, the 100 best sellers, uh, best selling books. And um, get me the images from the API, put that in memory, add that to my collection of images I want to detect. Um, maybe we'll, we'll also store the ISBN in memory with, with that as well. And then as you're moving your app around and you, you can then detect the book from book cover of one of the best 100 sellers, you know what book that is. Um, you can then maybe make a separate call to the Amazon API and say, right, go get me the reviews for this and then show me the reviews around that book in augmented reality. Uh, and because if you pick that book up, it will, um, and you can anchor those images to the book. And if you move the book around, um, those reviews will, will uh, move around as well. So that's why you might want to add those images to detect at compile time. All right, okay. So I've got three different videos on this and it's quite cool. Um, the first one, when it detects my business card, I'm placing a 3D model onto that card. And as I move the card around, um, it will maintain its position. Another one, when it detects my business card, it puts just images uh, next to the card. That's all it's doing. And as you move the card around, they move along uh, around with it because they're anchored to the, the image it's detected, if you remember. And then the third one, I'm placing a video at the location of the card. And when I move the card around, the actual orientation of video changes as well. So I'm just gonna quickly go through them. I used to have videos offline uh, for these, but I changed laptop and didn't have them with me. Right, so, da -da. right, let's do the car one first. It's pretty neat. All right, so it's detected that image. And when I'm when it detects that the image's orientation has changed, it knows to change the orientation of that 3D model as well. Uh, and that, that's pretty neat. Uh, you know, you could have hundreds of, of cars and stuff like that. It doesn't always as smooth as you want it to be, don't get me wrong, um, but you know, it, it's pretty cool. So that's, that's one thing. Then what was the other one? Oh yes, adding images to it. So the code for this is ridiculously simple. Um, the text here is actually just a transparent PNG. Now transparent PNGs work very well with this, I find. So yeah, that, they're just images you're placing next to the, I'm just saying for, for, for my headshot, just place it in the, just change the X coordinate to the, um, to the card you found, the image you found, just set it there and it will just maintain its position. And then the last one was a video, wasn't it? Is that it? Yes. Now I'll turn the video off, the sound off for this because it makes me jump sometimes. So again, I've done the other things. So if it detects the other side of my card, I'm playing a video on it. Um, and when I move the card around, it will uh, change the orientation of the video as well, which is quite neat. Again, so I don't know what the application is this. Some of this stuff you have to use your imagination for. Um, if you've not got a good imagination or very innovative, and I'll think, well, I can't think of any really use cases for augmented reality, it's probably not for you. Um, but yeah, it, you just got to use your imagination uh, and then it's the limit, it's, you know, it's limit, it's limitless what you could do with this sort of stuff, I guess. Now, body tracking. So this is built into ARKit. You'll, you'll start to see a theme. There's so much functionality built just out of the box for, for inside of ARKit. And this is just why I enjoy using it quite so much. Now with body tracking, it tracks uh, the major point, major uh, body joints. It could, if you look at this image of my, my daughter at the top right, the green positions, sorry, the green spheres that I'm placing um, at the detected body joints are the ones it, it detects. The white ones are the ones it infers. So it, it actually does detect the major ones and then it infers some of the minor body ones. So it kind of pretty much guesses uh, based on the orientation of the major joints where, where these other things are. Uh, what you all, can also do with body tracking is you can create a 3D model. I've not done this. This is just a picture of me using the example from Apple. What you can do is you can create a 3D model skeleton and you can 
you can rig it up so that it tracks your body movements. So yeah, so you might think, well, my, why would I want to use this? Um, so I've seen this sort of technology used for exercising. So you can also, because you can track the location, the X, Y, Z coordinates of the joints, you can track the location of them in relation to each other uh, and therefore roughly the, the movement that the person's doing. So you can check that the person may be doing um, weights, squats, uh, I don't lift weights. <laughs> uh, you can check they're doing that or doing press-ups or something like that. Um, I've seen it used to track people's posture and if they're slouching in their chair because they can look at the angle of the spine uh, compared to, to the head and the, the hip. So I've seen it used in those use cases as well. Uh, yeah, it can track either directly or in fair quite a large number of, of points in the body. Um, I should have really highlighted which one it tracks and which ones it infers here, so apologies for that. But for any of these, you can, for the skeleton it's detected, you can say, what is the XY position of blah, the chin joint, for example. And then once you've got that, you can do something with it. Um, you can you can place a hat on it, or you can, um, I don't know, what could you do with that? You could do quite a few different things. We'll go on to face tracking, which is a bit more use cases. Um, so you might be able to, you know, I can't think of a body tracking one off the top of my head. Right, let's go on to face tracking. Um, I'll skip that video because it it's just me just moving around looking silly. So I don't really want to show that. Plus you could watch it yourself if you go to the VR code or you go to my YouTube channel. So not really much added to add there. Now face tracking is again interesting. Um, so we've seen face tracking already if you think about it in real world examples. We saw a lady trying on spectacles. Uh, spectacles? Glasses? Who says spectacles these days? Um, glasses. Um, when and all you're doing there is placing a 3D model in relation to the face. And when you move your face around, it's just changing the, the location of the 3D model that's anchored to that face it's detected. Now, you can track up to three different faces simultaneously. So um, if my two kids were next to me and I could say, the first face you detect, give that, make that look... Um, just put like a sphere in front of it and the next one just keep a, a cube and another one a triangle or something um, so that you can attract it to three faces. I need to mention it is just face uh, detection not facial recognition okay so there's a lot of um, fallout in the media these days about facial recognition being used by sort of um, government states and stuff like that around the world mention no names um, or you know, police forces, but with, this isn't face identification or recognition, this is face detects. So it can detect that it's my face, sorry, it can detect there's a face in the scene or three faces, but it won't detect who it is, okay? Uh, da, da, da. Oh, it also starts the front camera when it's using this face tracking configuration and it's using, uh, it places a face anchor on in the scene. Now, I do have a video for that because created a bit of a silly video where it detects my face and it places rubbish advent calendar. Sorry, it's me showing off my Christmas jumper uh, in the scene. Oh, God, gosh, it takes a while for me to get to the good bit. Right, so as you see, I'm moving around my head. I've got a 3D model, got a bit of animation on, again, making it look a bit interesting rather than it being static. Uh, and some rounded cubes to the right hand side and if I move my head around it, it knows to move those 3D models uh, around at the same time. So yeah, so that is uh, facial tracking. Uh, da, 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 da. Do you, I'll quickly show you the code for that because we've not looked at some code in a while. Uh, da, 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 da. Facial tracking view patrol. Right, so boilerplate, boilerplate, boilerplate. One of the differences is we're now using an AR face tracking configuration because uh, you can provide it with a few different defaults. Here we're just saying I'm only interested in tracking one face. Uh, and then we're running this, running this um, <coughs> configuration 
and that is it that that start, starts it looking for faces in the sea more specifically the the front camera this time now what is what we are doing is we are setting a, a delegate that we say we want it to fire when it detects a face which is this one here so it's saying um if you detect a face sorry if you detect an anchor this should only fire when it detects a face so we're double checking that it's a face anchor and if it is we are saying create a face geometry facial geometry sorry and we want um the opacity to be 0.8 percent sorry 80 percent so it's not going it's going to be slightly uh, transparent and then da, 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 we want the node so what it does is, I've not just explained that very well, sorry. So as soon as it detects the phase, it drops an anchor at that position as well as a node. And what we can do at this point, we can take that opportunity to do the things to that node, these Lego bricks, if you remember, like say it's geometry and it's opacity. So I could make it red or blue if I wanted. <clears throat> and then we're also saying, if the face does change, um, then update the facial geometry as well. Uh, the first time I got this working, it looks a bit like this, and you'll see what the code's doing. I'll become clear in a minute. So when it detects the face, it automatically, the facial geometry it creates is a mesh of the face, so you don't have to do anything. Uh, and I'm saying set it to 80%, and by, by default, it must be white, because you, you could see that I wasn't setting a color there. Um, so if you can lip read, that's me saying it's working now. So this is the first time I got it working. So I was very pleased with myself, even though I looked like a scary mime and um, shocked myself a little bit. So you might think, well, what could you do with that? Well, we talked about glasses. Maybe you could look like what tattoos look like on your face. Um, you know, um, you can make your face look like a Spider-Man mask if you, if you want it, I guess. Now we can go do something a little bit more interesting with facial tracking. We'll just churn that one. We can actually detect facial expressions. And out of the box, AR kit can detect 52, I think it's 52, I might have miscounted, but 52 different facial expressions. So when I say an expression, I don't mean happy, sad, angry, frowning. Um, what it can do, it can detect different movements in different parts of the face. So it can detect whether your mouth is open, your tongue is out, you're puffing your cheeks, um, that you're looking left, right. Um, a lot of these, I've not actually been able to get it to fire. So mouth closed, yeah, I can do that. I don't know what um, mouth roll upper is or mouth stretch right is. So it's quite fun trying to contort your face to get these to, to activate it, to try and detect it. And when it detects these, it's on a floating, um, it's a floating scale from zero to one, whereas one is you have got your mouth wide open, <clears throat> whereas if you just got 0 0.1 jaw open, oh, sorry, 0 0.1 jaw open, it means your mouth's not very open. So they're not Boolean. It's not either opened or closed, eyes closed, open. It's kind of a d degrees in between. So then what can we do? So here, I've got a video of detecting the, the, the facial expressions, a smile, the lips down, eyes wide, eyes squint, I think, mouth funnel, tongue out, cheek puff, I think, eyes wide again. Um, so you can detect these and uh, yeah, eyes left, eyes right, and you can react to those. So if I wanted, if it detected me smiling, or I think it's, I think you can do right smile or it's something like um, corner of mouth up, I forget now. So if it detects that you're smiling, you could put something else in the scene. You could put like a, a happy sign above your head or then um, if you're sad, make it a, a, a sad thing. Um, and also instead of using the solid mesh as before, I'm using this um, grid lines mesh instead, which looks make, makes me look a bit like Hellraiser, which again, freaked me out the first time I got it working. <coughs> Now, you might think, well, what's the use cases of that? One use case that I could think of is perhaps maybe um, for people who've had a stroke and they've got um, half of the face paralyzed, for example, you could easily build something that helps them practice trying to move those muscles or seeing if that sort of 
those facial muscle muscles improve over time because you've got this degree of okay it's zero to one maybe maybe in january you could only move you could only smile at 10 percent, but maybe in february you could have been practicing with those muscles and um, maybe the stroke is i don't know much about strokes so apologies i'm not medically trained but um maybe it's getting a bit you're getting a bit better um, facial movement back and you can sort of track it like that that's one use case i thought of being able to track uh, facial uh, detections as well okay right 3d models so um some 3d models are amazing uh i can't create 3d models it's one it's on my list of things to do to be able to build 3d models like that and um but the good news is you can you can download some free 3D models from places like Free3D, uh, Sketchfab.com, and ARKit supports a number of different 3D models. Now the ones I've got working are the, the been the .dae, which I think is called the Collider format, and the .obj um, format as well. You can even create your own uh, using something like Blender, which I have done. As you can see from the, oh, no, that's the previous slide. There we go. There's two models here. I'll let you pick, I'll let you choose, decide which one I created. So for the top left-hand side, what I thought would be kind of neat is if you could um, try and create a fantasy football augmented reality app. So you're, you're in the pub with your mates. You could maybe do some plane detection, detect the top of the, uh, the bar table and then maybe you could say oh well, this is my fantasy football team and then you could um show what it looks like in, in augmented reality now there is something you can do which i've not not tried yet is you can actually share augmented reality sessions across iphones believe it or not so you could actually be creating an augmented reality session and other people could be sharing it as well <clears throat> not tried that but i believe it's possible you know, I created these little football shirts in Blender. You can see how detailed and amazing they look. And um, it's quite, quite neat. In fact, I've got a video for that. Let me show you the video. You can see an early uh, attempt at that. All right, so floating football pitch. Um, I don't have any football allegiances either. So anyone who is a Liverpool or Man United supporter can just stop cheering. I, yeah, I don't really have any football uh, I couldn't probably name any more teams that have red kits, but um, this was not, wasn't supposed to be any particular football team, I don't think. Probably Man City supporters all booing as well. That's Liverpool uh, meetup, isn't it? Maybe I should have done it a Liverpool theme. Anyway, I digress. Uh, and then the other thing that was kind of neat that I discovered is that um, if you use Blender, which is a 3D modeling tool, there is a plugin you can use called Blender GIS and you can actually get it to point at a location in Google Maps and create a 3D model of the um, terrain. So once I'd create that 3D model, I'd exported it into one of those earlier 3D model formats I explained, and then I could create some, do something neat like, uh, like this. Let's do this one. So again, placing it in the scene, fading it in, there's an animation. We come on about lighting in a bit because I've got a fake shadow underneath. And then we'll also come on to how I do the next thing as well, how I, what I'm actually doing is I'm touching my iPhone screen and I can do a pinch out uh, and make it grow and make it look bigger or less. So I can look like um, I've got a, a hill walk from the Peak District in my living room. And I could drop other things onto this 3D model. I could have photo, I could superimpose um, photos that I took along that walk or around the outside. You know, you do just need to use your imagination with some of this stuff. And then it, the more things you add and combine, the, the cooler these things they, these look. Right, UI gestures. So placing items in the scene would be a little bit boring if you couldn't interact with those items. So I'm just going to show you the different things you can do. So once you place something in the scene, and that might be as simple as a cube or uh, as complex as a terrain, if you pinch, it can detect that. And you can, you don't have to tell it to scale. You could tell it to do anything, but you can detect if you're pinching out or pinching in. 
uh, that you're rotating like this, that you're panning, that you're just moving left or right or up or down, or if you're swiping like a, a quick movement like this. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of videos for that as well. So the bore, I've got an interesting one and a boring one. So I hope you like pizza, because I've got one that showed pizza. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm calling the Unsplash API, which is an image pro provider, and saying, go get me images of pizzas, create me some 2D planes, place them on this detected surface that I've detected. And <clears throat> now I'm using, I'm turned on uh, UI interaction detection and it's detecting me touching one and moving it around. Now I'm pinching and I'm growing or the one I'm touching and now I'm rotating it to twist it. Um, so that's kind of neat. You might think, well, again, what's the use cases of these, of this? Now, one use case I've thought of, which will be kind of neat, is if you were like looking for a new house. Um, it's been a while since I looked for a new house, but I'm pretty sure that still, you still get like these A4 brochures of what the front of the house looks like, or then images of the inside. <clears throat> so you could place augmented reality uh, images of houses you've been interested in, because so quite often you've got like 10 houses you're interested in, you have to whittle them down to the ones you want to go visit. So you could like place them on the, 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 the desk, then maybe swipe the ones away you're not interested in, maybe put in a maybe pile and a yes pile, maybe press it, the one you're interested in, you can maybe hit an API and then place, we could go from 2D to 3D and place internal shots or external shots of that property all around you. So that's quite one uh, interesting use case that I thought you could do, um, not a chance to do it yet. And um, yeah, there's a bit of a boring video I won't show you, but that's just sh showing you the same thing that you can scale, rotate, pinch, that sort of thing. Right, lighting. Lighting's interesting. Um, it turns out that if you don't think about lighting and you're placing fake items in your augmented reality scene, they will look fake. If you, because the way our minds work is it uses a light to understand what's going on. Um, it, it kind of, it's, it's obvious when you talk about it, but if you place something in a scene and it looks bright, but everything else around it is dark, it looks fake. If you place a dark thing in a very light scene, it looks fake. Um, so what you can do is we can, um, we can use fake, sounds silly, but you could use fake lights to cast shadows on fake objects in your scene, to, to cast fake shadows onto fake planes. Um, and I'll show you a video how to do that in a minute. And if you if you want a to make your experiences looking reason even real more real, uh, I recommend you you add shadows. Otherwise, it just your brains think your brains fighting against itself, saying that doesn't look real. <clears throat> uh, so there's different lighting types you can use, but I don't want to go into them too much. Just just know that there's different lighting types you can use. Right. Okay. So I will uh, show you this video. And here we're just placing a box not a cube, but it happens to be a cube in this case, into the scene. I've got a fake light above it. I've got plane detection at the bottom and I've got a fake, a, a fake transparent plane. Sorry, that wasn't very long, that video. A fake transparent uh, plane that, that is clever enough to know that it needs to, to, that that fake object needs to cast a fake shadow on it when it, when there's a fake light source above it. Don't ask me how he does it, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, but you imagine if that shadow wasn't there, it would look a lot more fake. So I guess the takeaway from this is, if you want your scene to look more real, <clears throat> add shadows. <clears throat> right, physics. This is something I've probably not played around with enough, but what you can do is with the things you're placing in your scene, we can use um, scene kits, physics, framework system anyway the physics in, in sync it to make things solid so that it bumps into other things uh, because by default they won't bump into each other they'll just pass right through each other if you've got something that animates another way they're just gonna pass through each other so you can make them solid you can give them inertia you can give them mass or well, fake mass obviously uh, and you, you can tell things to be affected by gravity you can apply force as well so i've seen some games created where they've created a torus and people like firing spheres by applying a force 
and you get a nice arc that it's it's got a force, but then when that force runs out, gravity takes over and it moves it. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's have a quick look at physics. Right, this was an early example. So you can see right away what I mean by, um, so I placed a 2D plane onto this table and now I'm dropping boxes or cubes. Um, and I've told both all those nodes to have a solid, solid substance, but I've told the cubes to be affected by gravity. The, the 2D plane is effective just floating there, um, but the cubes are affected, I've told to affect by gravity, so they'll be pulled down until they hit something else that we've told to be a solid mesh. Now, you can, going back to my earlier point about lighting, this was an early example. You can tell this looks fake just because the lighting just doesn't look right um, compared to everything else. So if I wanted, I should do work on the lighting a bit better. Um, yeah, you can see them, them, them uh, the being affected by gravity, fake gravity. So that's physics. All right, okay, coming towards the end uh, of the presentation now, you'll be relieved to hear. There's a bunch of stuff we've not talked about, so I'll just quickly kind of say you can do, but we didn't talk about. So body occlusion. So I, AR kit's clever enough to know that if you place a, an object um, five meters in front of you, and if a person walks in front of the camera and that object, it's a new turn body occlusion on, it knows it knows to block, to occlude that object you put in, that there's, there's actual bod body being passed in front of it. So if a body stands in front of it, you shouldn't be able to see the object. So that's body occlusion. Session persistence, you can actually um, save the, your items you put in the real world. I think you can save, um, you can save uh, the feature points it's detected. So you'd have to detect them all again, I think. Um, and again, you can share these sessions amongst other running sessions as well. Uh, I've not tried that. Object detection, I should have updated these slides because I do have an example of object detection now. So what you can actually do is you can scan an object with your phone, get it to remember the feature points like around a stuffed bear or something. And in the same way you can get it to detect an Im image, you can then turn it to scanning, sorry, detection mode, and it will be able to detect that 3D teddy bear is in, in that scene and then you can uh, react to that um, to that event. Uh, constraints are interesting, so you can tell your nodes to always face another node or always face to, in a particular di direction. So they're useful in those scenarios. You can, and you can also um, the other thing I didn't go into any detail about, which I've never used because I don't have a new expensive uh, iPad, is, is lidar, which I believe you can just detect the surroundings a lot easier and map it with a higher degree of accuracy. And then you can pull those um, highly detailed 3D maps into your augmented reality experiences. We didn't talk about cameras. Um, we didn't talk about physically based rendering. So you can make things look a bit more real, make it a bit more rougher or smoother or give it more of a reflective surface. And the other thing I mentioned, these top three things is, these augmented reality experiences get more interesting when you start using other technologies. So if you start using real-time communication, using the signal art, you know, it's, it's gonna be more interesting. Um, I've not talked about geolocation either or Vision Core ML. So out of the box, I think, yeah, Xamarin all supported uh, Apple's Core Vision, Vision Core library to .NET. So if I wanted, I'm pretty sure I could use that in conjunction with augmented reality. So when I move my camera around, if it detects a banana in the scene, I can get it to put a label above the banana and it would just persist there so it's so moved around. Bit of an odd use case, but you could do that if you wanted. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, um, a lot of these examples and videos and code samples, if you want to go and play around with this yourself, is on a website I created called xamarinarkit.com. Now, the reason I put this together was because ARKit is from Apple, there's loads and loads and loads of examples online of how to do this in Swift and Objective-C. There's next to no samples of how to do this in .NET and C-Sharp. So I spent quite a bit of time converting those Swift examples into C-Sharp so that other people who want to try and create these augmented reality apps, experiences, 
um, using C Sharp and .NET and Xamarin, they can, they've now got these resources. Uh, they can Google it and they'll come back in the results and they, they won't have to try and translate Swift and Xcode themselves. Um, okay, starting to summarize it now. We talked about the business of ARKit, all the little building blocks that make up ARKit and this kind of things you can achieve in there. Um, all you need is a Mac, Visual Studio for Mac uh, and an iOS device. I think if you're trying to use an iOS 5 or 6, you might struggle. I think you might need seven or eight above. Um, the newer the device, the more sophisticated the camera, the better the, the processor in it, the better aug augmented reality experience you're gonna get. Um, so don't, don't be too disappointed if you've got an iPhone 6 and it's not working on it. Um, yeah, so you can use C Sharp and .NET to develop AI experiences uh, you know, today. And that's what the takeaway I wanted to, you to have today is this. And um, yeah, watch this space because I honestly think that you're gonna see more and more uh, job adverts for augmented reality developers. Um, so if you wanna get ahead of that curve, then you know, start looking at this stuff now, I'd recommend. So wrapping up now, um, FYI, I wrote a book on this and it's not published yet, <clears throat> but it will be published in June, I'm told. And um, so I've just taken a lot of those things and I've almost got like a one-to-one -one chapter for all the stuff we've already discussed, to be honest. Um, but it, it shows you the code samples, explains them in a bit more detail. And um, if you do want to get started, that might be a, a good way of doing it. I'm not sure. Some people learn well from videos. Some people um, read books. But uh, that's going to be coming to the market soon. Uh, yep. Yeah. So giving you those URLs, just uh, just say thank you. I'll wrap, the, wrap up there if that's all right, Joshua. Thanks to everyone for persevering and... Um, and getting through that and uh, I'll take any questions um, at this point if it's all right Joshua. Yeah that's great Lee. thank you great presentation. Um, so from me just, um, obviously we'll, if anyone else got any questions just feel free to take yourself off the microphone and um, I'll put something in the chat if you prefer as well um, but I guess I guess from a question from from my side um, how long does it take to sort of build some of these apps up so You've got so many great examples. Uh, for instance, the periodic table, is that something you get in a day, a couple of days, a week, a month? Uh, to be honest, I, I've got to the point now where the periodic table can do in, I was gonna say 30 minutes, but let's be a developer and double that estimate an hour. Um, I, to be honest, I just started with placing a sphere in front of me, well, behind me it turns out, but just trying to, and then just moving from there. So then once you've got a sphere, and then you learn you can you can put a, an image or wrap it around an image. You can then have a make a globe appear there, and then you learn about animations, and then you learn you can rotate it. So it's just learning the individual skills and then building them up and joining them together to build these experiences. The the periodic table one's a fantastic example because all that is is two D geometries with text on with animations where I'm fading the opacity and the animations. Um, one after another or randomly as it happens. And then, then I'm using UI interaction. So when I touch it and it detects that, I'm playing another animation. So it is just adding three or four things together. It's not like really, it's not really, really complicated C++. You know, it's not, it's not complicated code. It's just lots of little bits of code joined together. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the main power in it, I think is like you said, it's your imagination, isn't it? Because, um, I read a lot about augmented reality and then when I found a YouTube channel and I started looking at some of the stuff you were doing, I was pretty amazed. I was pretty like, oh God, yeah, why didn't I think of that? Um, so yeah, just, have you got anything else in the pipeline that you're thinking of doing? I've, I've had loads, yeah. So um, NASA do a hackathon every year and this year was what I was going to do, but I didn't end up doing was um, hit their API for, for moon image, uh, sorry, Mars, images of Mars that the, the Mars rover took. So then I could have it just all the Mars rover images just around me. Now they also have a 3D model of the Mars uh, rover that you can download. So you could have that in the middle in the actual Mars rover augmented reality in the middle of the room surrounded by pictures. They'd be rotating uh, of, of the Mars landscape. So that there's all sorts. Um, gosh, what else have I wanted to do? I've not got around to doing. Um, so, oh gosh, there's quite a few. Oh, but yeah, so one what I wanted to do was um, just 
heating up of APIs. So remember the face one we looked at and I just put the advent calendar around. I wanted to hit up the Apple Health API and have it show the number of steps. I'm not sure it'd have real-time heartbeat, but steps, distance and stuff like that. So that kind of get your augmented reality um, uh, health dashboard and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it, it's just about using your imagination, as you say. One of the main things I thought of is like people spend what, thousands and thousands of pounds on like a window surface and, you know, tables which are interactive and you've got it all there. Uh, so it's just, it's just amazing. You can just take away the hardware and just completely reduce your costs. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the hardware translates to, into other hardware. So I know uh, there's been a police force or constabulary uh, in Yorkshire that did an experiment, I think, with black marble uh, where they developed a crisis response uh, app whereas the the police officers would wear in, in the headquarters would wear the hololens i said we wouldn't talk about hololens but this is a good example uh, and then they could see lots and lots of maps and figures uh, of real-time crime happening and happening and other than spending a lot of money on 70 inch screens um you know don't get me wrong the hololens isn't cheap um but um you know it, it, it opens other opportunities, like you say. I think another one is I've seen crime scenes as well. I think um, people have used augmented reality. I've seen a use case where uh, they've scanned the crime scene and they can place markers in the crime, uh, crime scene and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Um, thank you for the, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to push the, push the, um, the website as well. Uh, examinarkit.com onto the Twitter onto our Twitter page and advertise that's great. Um, you said like there wasn't a lot of examples, like there was a lot of Objective C, Swift. Uh, how did you find it? How did you find learning it? Was the documentation good or did you struggle? I was amazed to be honest that Microsoft aren't pushing this technology more, more um, and that as a result, developers just haven't picked up some of this stuff. I honestly feel like. I've been the first to do some of this stuff for the, for the body detection uh, and the placing of the spheres on the joints. I could not find any reference to any .NET developers doing that anywhere. So uh, if, I've, if I wasn't the first person to, to create that, write the code for that, to, to implement it, um, I was certainly one of the first. I couldn't find any videos, any code for it. Um, and you end up digging into the, the Apple um, documentation as well as the the Xamarin AR kit documentation as well uh, on MS Lane or wherever it is but yeah it's 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 one of them is because there's so few examples of how to do it in C sharp not everything translates directly from Swift and Xcode to C sharp sometimes the classes are slightly named differently so you have to guess and, and try these things so when you do get something working it's just a, a great big eureka moment so yeah it's uh, it feels like it honestly feels like I must be one of the first developers to try and do this. And because of that, I'm like, this is amazing. I need to let more .NET developers know that you can do this because whilst I'm using my imagination to come up with some use cases, I'm sure other people can come up with, with different ones as well. No, that's greatly. Um, if there's no other questions, I think we'll, we'll wrap up there. Um, I'll stop the recording. So yeah, thank you, Lee. No problem. Thanks for having me.